Connectivity Conference. We are about to start the Plenary 4, which is the first session of this morning, which is Financing and Public-Private Partnerships. And uh, one house, and house announcement for the people who've joined in this morning. Uh, I'm sure all of you must have received this postcard uh, when you must, must be registering. We are using this app for polling purposes. It's called Slido app. It's very simple instructions. Would request all of you to please just go on onto the web and you can engage, ask questions using this app itself and also take part in the polling when the sessions are ongoing. So with that, would request uh, Mr. Deepak Bagla to take over the proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have you all here. It's an early morning for Delhi by all standards. And uh, I know Thilan was telling me in Sri Lanka, you people start much earlier. In Delhi, we are a little late on that one. But uh, I'll tell you why I'm excited about the panel this morning. One is, I think it's the subject by itself. PPP is being looked at in many ways, and it's becoming rather challenging because it's being used far more broadly and deeply today than ever before in economic history. And I'll give you an example. For example, the rolling out of the entire core infrastructure sector, especially, if you notice, was typically either done by the church or the state themselves. It was not really in a PPP structure. And the problem being that one P was always looking for welfare and the other P was looking for profits. And there were divergent interests sitting on that one. So keeping those challenges in mind and the other advantages, we thought that is what makes this a very interesting topic to take on. And also because today we have, and when I say a distinguished panel, it is indeed because we have a set of people who are both policy makers and practitioners. So we get the chance to see all elements of this in a 360 manner. What we thought I'll do is I'll, uh, it's my privilege just to quickly introduce to you, not that they need much introductions, they're also well known. On my extreme left is uh, Thilan Vijay Singh, and uh, he's currently the chairman and the acting CEO of the Public Pri Private Partnership Unit of the Finance Ministry of Sri Lanka. I also got to know that many decades ago, he was in a role what I'm trying to do today for the government of India. So there's a lot of learning in any case, which I have to take off from you after this one. He's also the chairman of TW Corp, Sapphire Sri Lanka, Digital Commerce, and uh, the co-founder and the board member for life for Sri Lanka Institute of IT, the chairman and director general of the BOI Sri Lanka. That's right, but you know, it's a long list which continues to learn. And uh, it'll be great to hear from him because I think what they did during his time also as the chairman of BOI there is uh, they really transformed the entire landscape of investments which were uh, coming into Sri Lanka. I also have the privilege to introduce to you Amber Dube. Amber is a partner with KPMG. He's heading the aerospace and the defense division. Amber has done several assignments right across India, including the Airport Authority of India and uh, the Ministry of Civil Aviation, etc., which is a big sector, as you know, is opening up in India. We assume that we are one of the fastest growing civil aviation markets in the world. Uh, with over two and a half decades of work experience, he's a partner with the Aerospace and Defense with KPMG. And uh, he's from IIT Mumbai and I am Ahmedabad. On my extreme right, on my ex uh, immediate right is uh, Kijang. He's a public servant and a management consultant, a project leader, who's currently servicing as a country manager in multi-rational corporation. That's very interesting, Keshang. And it'll be very interesting to hear from him, because as you know, Bhutan is uh, number one on the index of happiness. And there's a lot which you'll be doing, so we look forward to hearing from you on this. And we have our star with us, which is Bill Pigas. Bill is uh, extremely well known in the world of PPP structures. And he leads the debt financing and energy infrastructure projects in emerging and frontier markets at the OPEC. And uh, there's some very interesting project developments which are happening on that side. So we'd love to hear from you on that. Over two and a half of uh, decades of work experience in international oil, gas, and power financing, also with Exxon Mobil and Exxon Mobil Corporation, even before they were merged and after they were merged and an independent consultant in Canada, and also with the US Department of Energy. Pleasure to have you all with us. I thought what we'll do is, uh, we'll keep opening it up for you whenever you want to, please. If you have any questions, 
keep coming into it, we'd rather make it more conversational. But we'll have a few opening remarks. And what we thought were the, some of the focus areas we were asked to look at is one is PPC. PPP itself is a structure in sustainable development and its applicability to that. And the second is how we can use that as a structure in a thought process to increase the connectivity specifically between South Asia and the region itself. So, Thilan, we'll love to start with you on this one. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Deepak, for that introduction. And again, thanks for the invi invitation. I'm particularly thrilled to be aware at this particular time where Sri Lanka is going through a period of figuring out whether we have one prime minister or two prime ministers. So, um, so this is a particularly good period to, to, to uh, chill out here in Delhi and, and later in Mumbai over the weekend. Um, I would like to rewind as far as our PPP experience is concerned to 1996 when as a relatively younger investment bank I was invited by the government to set up what was then the first unit of the PPP uh, cap capability within the Board of Investment. And that was a time where we learned some very important lessons on how PPP should be done at a time when Sri Lanka had a war risk premium. And by virtue of having a war risk premium and there being a paucity of foreign investment in the country, compelled us to be extremely process oriented and rigid in terms of how we structured a project in order that it became bankable and financeable. So if, you were, if I were to go back to the lessons, which, are, which I believe remain valid even to this date, on how that team of young professionals who was headhunted to do PPPs, all of whom were in their 20s and 30s at the time, managed to financially close $800 million of PPP transactions at a time of war, I believe is, is, is quite an important lesson. And firstly, the learnings were, one, the importance of project preparatory funding in order to do the required pre-feasibilities and the assessment of the project's viability prior to soliciting the project, we had funding from USAID, it was grant funding, and we used that liberally in order to prepare for project funding. So that's important. The secondly is the understanding of the, of the and the separation between bankability and risk, and what policy instruments needed to be in place to address issues of bankability. So at the time, Sri Lanka had very thin capital markets. Even today, our capital markets are thin. So the government decided to set up what was called the private sector infrastructure development company, which provided 12 to 15 year loan money to PPP projects that went through a successful procurement cycle. And that funding was given by the World Bank and the ADB. We also looked at political risk issues. We worked very closely with MEGA. And, and, and worked on credit enhancement related issues in order to make sure the project was financeable. Right at the outset, we also understood the importance of legal documentation and for, for every PPP transaction that we were doing for the first time, we obtained the services of international legal firms that worked very closely with the PPP unit and the Attorney General's department. And that gave us proper documentation, which we even today use as a template. And finally, I cannot say this enough, the importance of people who can negotiate and also carry, carry with us skeptical bureaucrats, politicians, and sometimes even compete and deal with foreign multilateral agencies who were trying to tread into areas that could have better been funded by PPPs. And I still remember going back to the first experience where we structured Sri Lanka's first ever, or, well, South Asia's first ever port sector BOT in the port of Colombo which enhanced the port's capacity to become a regional port. For example, uh, we had to deal with JICA, who wanted to fund it as a government-to-government -government loan. So when we looked at the PPP proposal and the JICA proposal, it was quite interesting to note that the JICA proposal on a per 20-foot equivalent basis was going to cost 2.2 times than the private sector proposal. So right at the beginning, we were able to learn that procuring competitively through private sector versus public sector procurement through multilateral agencies has certain upfront uh, cost benefits. But the more important outcome of that first ever port sector PPP was the efficiency enhancement of the Port of Colombo, which increased, and it's a mind-boggling figure, by 85%. Actual ship waiting time improved 90%. And that PPP has now been used as a template for the subsequent uh, terminals. So to fast forward to today, sorry if I'm talk, talking a bit too long, but uh, you know, fast forwarding to today, the challenges are these. Because of the people issue being neglected, Sri Lanka lost its way for about 
a little bit more than 10 years. So my challenge on the basis of an invitation I received by about a year ago by the new finance minister is to rebuild PPP capacity within the finance ministry, deal with a big elephant in the room, unsolicited proposals, which we actively discouraged and did not do in the late 90s, and we continue to look at with great degree of suspicion. We had to deal with the sheer complexity of PPP projects because the low-hanging fruit were already in operation, the power projects, the easy ones. And we very soon came to a realization, and this is a proven statistic, that 55 to 65 percent of PPP projects in Asia are not bankable without government or multilateral assistance because they are now inherently complex in, in nature. So, so at the moment, we are in the process of building that foundation and building a foundation that is based on really two key principles. One is, this is a new buzzword in PPPs, building capacity for blended financing and viability gap funding. In order to address that issue of 55, 60% of PPP projects not being financeable bank through, through, through traditional fun, uh, funding sources. Secondly, tapping into project preparation pipeline funding. We were quite fortunate at the PPP agency. We've now got $25 million of World Bank funding uh, under, the, under, under the project preparation facility line of funding, and that we are using to look at the basics of pre-feasibility and project preparation work. Um, in order to address this issue of blended financing, we are working very actively within the finance ministry to inculcate within the ministry the importance of what I call this third source of funding. Traditionally, we have the consolidated fund, the taxpayers' money, then we have external resources, aid money, and PPP funding, and viability gap funding and blended financing being that very third force. So therefore, just to touch on the aspect of the future, uh, I, I believe that PPP funding should be focusing on three areas. Firstly, building relationships with agencies uh, connected with or able to provide blended financing and viability gap funding, especially for SDG type projects. And this involves dealing with green financing, catalyzed, uh, the green financing window of the ADB, multilateral size, such as the IFC, climate funds, sovereign funds, Denmark and Norway, for example, are providing funding for renewable energy, social impact funds, the Sustainable Development Investment Partnership of the World Economic Forum, uh, the second point in terms of the future is understanding the workings of what I called funding enablers. And that is, that, are in, that, that for example, are uh, credit enhancement instruments dealing with MEGA, OPIC, uh, Japan Export Credit Agency, IFC, where IFC is now working on structuring PPPs that can, can obtain insurance uh, uh, risk coverage. CGIF of Japan, which is, a, which, is a, which is an organization that guarantees local currency bonds for PPPs. Then you have the traditional sources of OECD, ADB, and IBRD. The third element, which is absolutely crucial and have been forgotten for many years, is the issue of fiscal cost and risk management arising from PPPs, where governments continually con continue to be blind to the in direct and indirect fiscal costs of entering into PPP agreements. So as at the moment, we are looking at correcting the procurement method to have an evaluation process right at the beginning to see whether the contingent risks are affordable to the government going forward. Uh, just to give you a shocking example, we recently ran an exercise through a window of the IMF called PFRAM, and we found that the Cabinet of Ministers of Sri Lanka have approved PPP projects just in the power sector valued at 10.6% of GDP and the total number of PPPs that have been initiated by the various line ministries worked out to 23% of GDP. A majority of this are not financeable and cannot be afforded by the government of Sri Lanka. So, coming back to the final part of my uh, opening remarks, sorry if it is going, going a bit long, it's aspect of collaboration, which I believe is the missing component for us to go forward as nations of South Asia. Now, as I mentioned earlier, 40% of PPPs, I believe, is project preparation, 60% is documentation. But the missing, missing piece is collaboration. So therefore, I believe that PPP agencies of the region need to collaborate. We need to look at bundling of projects. 
I, I heard yesterday about Nepal and India, the power sector initiatives. I, in one of my private sector companies, we are developing a, a hydro project in Nepal, and I do believe that bundling of projects and building scale as far as projects are concerned is important by governments working together. Then addressing regional policy issues on impact that are impacting on financing. Again, the elephants in the room are exchange control restrictions, exchange rate restrictions, thin capital markets, particularly what we have in Sri Lanka. Information sharing, so we can benchmark. You, the India's cost of generating solar power is far, far, far lower than Sri Lanka's. I need to understand why, for example. Then sharing good governance practices in terms of procurement methods. Um, then the best way to deal with multilaterals who sometimes compete with private sector investments on, uh, on PPPs. And then another important aspect is dealing with this, what I heard, a nice terminal, terminology of trust deficit because there are geopolitical issues impacting India and Sri Lanka, in particular when it comes to port sector. And again, the PPP agencies and your agency, we can collaborate in addressing some of these issues. So in, finally, what I would like to say is that it is very important that we look at how we connect financial services and knowledge sharing in the area of PPPs because I do believe that it will bring significant benefits in building a portfolio or a pipeline of financeable and bankable projects. Thank you. Thank you, Selin. That was very interesting. And what's very commendable is that you got $800 million at rather challenging times. I am going to come back to you on understanding on how you got to do that. And more importantly, what were the personal challenges you had when you came from the private sector into the government? So just hold on to that thought. But I thought I'll take it all to Amber now. You've heard the government inside, so you've dealt a lot with the government. And as I've been seeing, you've been doing all these projects with the airport authority, etc. Just wanted to hear from you your perspective and your experiences on both dealing with the government, seeing the private sector, and how you see that bridge happening between the two. Namaskar and a very good morning. Uh, thank you so much, Deepak. It's, a, it's an honor to be here on this uh, forum and to be speaking to so many learned people in the audience. I'll, I'll stick to just uh, the 10-minute uh, uh, limit and just, just focus on some very practical uh, examples of uh, uh, what we have seen. Uh, uh, we've been involved in the air, uh, airport sector. We've seen the first uh, uh, wave of PPPs uh, with the Hyderabads and Bangalores, and then in 2006, we had the Delhi and Mumbai airports coming in. Uh, big, big step, because for India, nobody ever imagined that one day we'll give out our national capital and our commercial capital uh, airport to uh, the uh, private sector, which is not really uh, very trusted at that time. And now, uh, that was 2006, and it's been almost uh, 12 years that we had this, the third wave of uh, privatization and PPP when we had Navi Mumbai and MOPA, where we were transaction advisors to the respective governments of Maharashtra and Goa, and now we're working in government of Andhra Pradesh for the uh, Vizag Second Airport. And we are also working, as we speak, uh, in redrawing the uh, concession agreements for all future airports. There's a big project under Nab Nirman, as we call it, uh, with the Ministry of Civil Aviation, where we have, uh, we're putting in all the learnings that we've received over the last 10, 12 years of PPP in the airport sector, uh, and taking a lot of inputs from the, from the funding agencies, from the developers, uh, foreign airport companies, which have generally stayed away from India, and understanding the reasons why, and then trying to incorporate it into the new concession agreements and the new tariff mechanism that we are likely to uh, come up with. So, uh, just just to quickly come to the specific points that you also see on the screen and what uh, Deepak also asked, I, I guess if I can just summarize our entire learning into three letters, I would say A, S, and P. Uh, a stands for affordability, S for sustainability, and P for predictability. So, if I'm a financier. Uh, or a funding institution looking at the airport sector. And as Deepak also rightly mentioned, we are the fastest growing uh, aviation market in the world. Uh, this is our 55th month, I'll repeat, 55th month of double-digit growth, continuous 55 months, uh, nowhere in the world is this happening. 
and uh, so much so that now our airports are choked and uh, there's no way to grow because none of us predicted this kind of a, a growth. So it's like Indians are suddenly taking to the skies like never before. We were uh, uh, lagging at some 10th or 11th position just about five, six years back. And we've already come very close to UK, which is number four. Uh, inshallah, we'll take them over, uh, overtake them uh, very soon. And then there'll be that uh, last mile fight with China and the US. And hopefully the vision and the dream is that uh, uh, by 2030, we'll give them a tough fight first, we'll overtake US. Again, it sounds silly, funny, ridiculous. But then as I say, w dreams are not dreams unless they are silly. And, uh, uh, and then we'll take on a good friend across the Himalayas, the Chinese. Uh, so, coming back to PPP, there's no other way, uh, no, uh, it's a TINA factor as we call it, there is no alternative. Because uh, uh, coming from a country where we have so many uh, uh, issues on the social side, money from the government, from the exchequer will always go towards social objectives and not into hard infrastructure, where there are people who are willing to, uh, to pay. So PPP is here to stay, number one. Number two, uh, being a so-called third world country with a very raucous uh, politics and uh, with a very huge, uh, very, very, uh, I would say, active or, or hyperactive uh, electronic media and now social media which is going berserk, I think uh, it's a very, very important issue to maintain a balance between what we call mathematics and optics. Well, everybody in this room is all experts in, in PPP structuring, finance, interest rates, etc., uh, currency issues, uh, okay, cost of capital, etc. But somewhere we, if we miss out the optics part, and I'll, uh, and I'll come to that point very quickly, because uh, if you've seen in the, in the case of Delhi, there was a lot of dispute when uh, about five years back, uh, the regulator allowed about 803 rupees, that's about 11 or 12 dollars per person, unheard of kind of uh, 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 tariffs and on top of that there was an airport development fee of another 200 rupees. So 1003 rupees, 1003 was what all of us were paying when we were flying from Delhi five years back in 2013. And now it's down to 83 rupees because it was a cost plus model. I'm not going to details because this is hardly the time. Uh, it was on a cost plus basis, so when uh, the asset was built and uh, many feel and there was an allegation that there's been some kind of a gold plating or overbuild, over engineering because it was on a cost plus basis. So whatever you build, uh, you are apply, you're given a fair rate of return on that huge capex, and that is ultimately passed on to the passengers. So first and foremost, I think from the optics perspective, it's very important to follow somewhat similar to what uh, we see in the highway model or the ports model where a particular rate is fixed in the beginning and it stays that way and that it increases its peg to the inflation. Uh, so that it's, it remains affordable. In that ASP that I spoke about, affordability is very, very important, not just from a uh, mathematics, but also from an optics perspective. Any super normal profit, any feeling, even in, uh, of, uh, like we've seen this in the case, those who are familiar with the Gurgaon toll plaza or the Noida toll plaza, where, I mean, thousands of crores were spent to build that the beautiful uh, NH8, uh, that whole Gurgaon expressway, and whatever was predicted as a traffic, which will be five years hence, was breached on day zero. On day one, when the toll plaza was opened, uh, that traffic was reached. And then there was this big backlash saying that uh, uh, the amount spent by the player is so much, and if you multiply just a back of the envelope calculation, number of cars and number of vehicles multiplied by the toll, I mean, you suddenly you figured out that in two or three years, uh, the, the concessioner is going to recover all his, all his investment. So if it was a 20 or a 30 year uh, concession, it was felt that there's a huge super normal profit that they're getting. So the public pressure was built on the government to actually remove the toll operator, remove the toll uh, plazas, and the government should just pay back, compensate them, and buy out the asset and make it public. So uh, that's again another example of this, this super normal profit and the optics and the politics part. Yeah. Quality standards, of course, are very important. It's be uh, best to be defined at before, at the time of the RFP, and at the time of the signing of the concession agreement itself, because uh, many times uh, under politics, we've seen pressure coming from the government side. This is off the books uh, to build this or build that because it, it gets good uh, photo ops for the government. And this is something which we have to be very careful about. The more we freeze the quality standards and the KPIs, now, of course, you can inbuild the improvement in KPIs because, I mean, when uh, you have a 30 or 40 year contract, so none of us can foresee the march of innovation and technology, say, 10 or 20 years down the line. So it should be flexible, but at the broad level, the parameters should be frozen so that, uh, uh, I mean, the, the financiers and the developers don't face any distress later on. Then there are some specifics I, I would rather leave it to the interaction session, uh, the things on inflation. There's this, uh, a big debate whether uh, the tariff should be completely pegged to inflation. There is another school of thought which says it should be pegged to only half or 70% of the inflation because the 
uh, we are in a, in a high growth phase, so uh, whatever you lose out on the inflation pegging, you can more than make up by the volume growth, the traffic growth which we are seeing at the moment, and inshallah this will continue, and also from an efficiency perspective. So how much of inflation should be, uh, how much of the tariff should be pegged to inflation uh, is a design question and uh, very important to the lenders. Uh, duration. In Brownfield, uh, uh, again, big debate whether it should be 20, 30, or 40 years. Uh, our feeling is that the duration, ideally 20 years is fine in a Brownfield one because most of the capex risk and the traffic risk is sort of mitigated and it's get, uh, good to get a, a price discovery every 20 years. Whereas for Greenfield, whether it's airports, ports, or some of the larger high capex uh, investments, probably it's better to go for 40 or 50 years because it will capture two or three capex cycles and the recovery for the uh, lenders and project proponents will be that much more convenient. In terms of bid parameter again, big debate, uh, should it be based on tariff, the one who quotes the lowest tariff should win, or should we freeze the tariff and do the bidding on the concession fee, lease fee, or whatever fee we may name it, uh, which the uh, project operator pays back to the government. And uh, here again, uh, the feeling in India is that uh, there is a possibility because of maybe lack of institutional maturity because PPPs are just about 10 or 20 years old that uh, if we uh, leave it to the, uh, the toll or the user fee, there's a chance that people may do some crazy stupid bidding and uh, uh, quote so low in order to win that it may just become unsustainable and we might have to terminate them just as two, two, three or five years down the line. So the prevailing thinking is that we freeze the tariff at a reasonable level based on a lot of debate, discussion and feedback from stakeholders and then do the bidding on concession fee. Now, of course, you can always argue that somebody can do a crazy bidding on the concession fee also. But generally, we've seen the trend that uh, uh, people have been mature about that. Then uh, there's also this issue about revenue share versus uh, should be revenue share, because revenue share means we then have to get into very intrusive accounting of what exactly is revenue. Because if you look at an airport or a port or, or, a, or an inland waterway uh, uh, terminal, there's so many line items on the revenue side that it could be just reimbursements, it could be sale of assets, it could be, uh, it could be uh, admin charges. Now, in a government setup, when you have a government body reviewing uh, the revenue items, most of these issues become very, very controversial. And uh, every line item, it could even be a, a $10 uh, revenue line, and if it goes into a dispute, in the government, unfortunately, we cannot get into a settlement. The government can never settle. It has to go to the court, and only a court can settle. Now, for every $10, $100, $1, $1,000, if you start going to the courts, it's, it's not going to be uh, very sustainable, neither for the, for the uh, private party, public party, or the, or the lenders. So the prevailing thinking now is that it's best to uh, link it to a very transparent rupees per ton or dollar per ton, uh, because uh, the tons or the number of passengers, that's a measurable number, just multiply that by the, that number and you know what the uh, revenue share uh, to the government has to be. Uh, I'll just quickly just rush through some of the other points. Uh, in PPP, the, one of the big issues also comes in that if it's a 40-year contract, what happens in the last 10 years? Because typically, uh, People can predict up to the first 20 or 30 years, but in the last 10 years, because you're about to exit in 10 years, there's always a feeling or a suspicion that uh, if there's some capex required, the, con the concession, the private player may not invest because there's not enough time to recoup. So there are alternative methods being thought through, wherein uh, we are saying that maybe 80 or 90 percent of the undepreciated amount uh, which is left on the last day of the concession period should be paid by the government to them or maybe recovered from the next concessioner because uh, in the last two or three years you may actually select the next concessioner who may take on. So there are very interesting uh, uh, models being worked upon to ensure that even late stage capex, the, the, uh, the march of development should not stop just because uh, the, uh, the period is coming to an end. Uh, contract negotiation, again, a big problem in, uh, across the world because as I said, if we cannot even predict the oil price for next week, here we are signing contracts, a prenup agreement uh, for a wedding which is going to last 40 years. Not going to be easy, right? So there should be some kind of a contract negotiation like we have more marriage counselors. Unfortunately, in India, that has not worked because any, any change of our, even a comma or a full stop can immediately, the sort of politics that we have here, it can become a huge, huge issue of an ungainly nexus or unholy nexus between the two parties. So this is one area which I think most of the countries in South Asia will have to work on. Uh, if you're looking at uh, col collaboration, like Tilan also mentioned uh, in this area, we had the Uran scheme, now we are going for international Uran scheme. 
Uh, in 2016, we were part of the uh, a team which drafted the National Civil Aviation Policy. We have an NCAP, National Civil Aviation Policy 2016. And as part of that, uh, we had made open skies for all countries beyond 5,000 kilometers and within SARC region. So within SARC, so if uh, Dylan wants to set up an airline tomorrow, uh, he doesn't need any permission uh, or, or the seat quotas, like we have uh, this running feud with uh, Singapore and Dubai and other countries because we treat them as competition. Uh, so there are, there are seat quotas, there are qual uh, quantitative restrictions on the number of seats you can uh, bring into India or take to Dubai every week. But for South Asia, uh, it, it was made a special uh, dispensation that there will be no, no limits. Any number of flights from Bhutan or, or Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh can come into uh, India. Uh, and uh, last but not the least, uh, I'll again reiterate what uh, Thilan just mentioned. Uh, nothing can take away the value of continuous dialogue. So for, from a lender's perspective, developer's perspective, or government's perspective, because governments will come and go, minimum, uh, maximum five years, or minimum could be even less. That need for a dialogue, because things change, innovations happen, ideas change, and each, each of the different components in a PPP, ultimately the public, the, the end user, the government, the, uh, the developer, and the lender. Unless we talk, talk, and talk, it may lead to lots of, you see, lots of heated debates in the ministry uh, when we have these uh, stakeholder conferences, but only good things come out of it. So that's where I'll uh, end my uh, 10 minutes of fame. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amber. That was excellent. And I think <laughs> what you gave us is a background on the construction of a concession, which is the most critical thing. And obviously, the points which we are going to take up in the last part on how we're going to increase this cooperation. Thank you very much. And Bill, I'm going to turn towards you now. Great. It's your Thank show. You. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak, and to my colleagues here and to all of you for coming early in the morning for, for Delhi. I'm Bill Pegues. I uh, work in the Structured Finance and Insurance Group of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which is the development finance institution of the United States government. Um, what we do is to combine US-based equity in development finance and investment opportunities in developing markets around the world. Uh, this is an exciting time for us. There was legislation passed uh, through the US Congress and signed by President Trump in early October that will transform OPEC, which has existed for 47 years at this point, into a U United States International Development Finance Corporation that will take our current authority of lending and political risk insurance from its present ceiling of $30 billion all the way up to $60 billion. It will dramatically increase our ability to finance development projects around the world. Um, it will also enable us for the first time to lend in foreign currencies, which particularly, for example, in India is a, uh, a major issue because of the requirement of, of local currency-based financing. And so we will have an in-house treasury group that enables us to do what our peer lenders at the IFC and other regional devel development banks are able to do. Just a brief background on OPEC's history and, and how we started out. We were formed in 1971 as a political risk insurance entity at a time when that concept didn't even exist. And over the course of the 1970s, and 1980s as OPEC and then the MEGA arm of the World Bank began to offer political risk insurance in risky locales around the world. A commercial market in political risk insurance developed to the point at which today, if you look at our $23 billion book of business that we have, only approximately 10% of that comes from political risk insurance. The rest of it is from lending both to SMEs through our small and medium enterprise finance group and to larger energy infrastructure projects and um, on lending through banks that we do in my lending group in OPIC, the Structured Finance and Insurance Group. So that's my, my brief summary and commercial for, for OPIC. Um, I really enjoy speaking on panels like this, um, not simply because I like communicating what I do, and, and talking with my peers and, and spreading the message. But because what we do is very, very interesting and, and very crucial. And particularly, I spent my career, as Deepak had mentioned, almost exclusively in the private sector. I did oil and gas financing from the beginning of my career um, up until about 10 years ago. And I've worked for OPIC for the past seven years. 
What's very interesting about the work that we do is that it has a substantial intersection with policy making and with foreign policy. For example, OPEC doesn't simply exist to finance development projects. We are also um, an integral part of US foreign policy. And so today, under the current administration, the Indo-Pacific region is very, very important to the United States and its foreign policy. This region has always been very important to, to OPEC. I happen to coordinate our portfolios in South Asia. Uh, we have a substantial book of business in Pakistan and India, to a lesser extent in Sri Lanka. Um, and we would like to be active in, in Nepal and Bhutan to, to the extent that bankable projects exist there. But what's very interesting about it is when I come to conferences such as this, and I had the pleasure of being in Kolkata, uh, two, I guess two years ago now, um, at the initial regional connectivity conference, is that we have policymakers talking a great deal about creating what economists would call the software of institutional infrastructure. And when we talk about physical infrastructure, tangible things that we're building, uh, from an economic perspective, none of that can exist without the, the institutional infrastructure underlying it. And that is, as you know, Talan alluded to when he was talking about um, the, the excess of PPP opportunities, many of which simply aren't bankable, to what Amber was alluding to also in the sense of you need some sort of stability in tax and law and fundamental economics to draw private capital into a PPP infrastructure. Most of what OPIC does is private developers will come to us and they want to invest equity in a project. And let's just take for the, for the sake of, of ease a power project. They will go to the government. The government has some sort of power purchase agreement backed by usually a government-run entity, perhaps with a sovereign guarantee based upon the creditworthiness of that entity. Um, and the whole project financing is predicated upon some sort of stability, that the government isn't going to revoke the terms of that power purchase agreement over a, a 10 to 15 year tenor of, of the debt. PPPs are a little bit different in the sense that there is a great deal more government participation in, in the structure. And where there is more government participation, and particularly in the PPPs, where the government actually maintains ownership of the asset, there tends to be a lot more mutability in uh, the playing field that is affected by politics over the life of the asset. And so from an investor's perspective, if it's putting capital into a market over a period of 10, 15, 20 years, that political, potential political instability uh, makes that provider of capital quite nervous. And a lot of what we do at OPEC and through our colleagues at, at the embassies around the world, and I see my colleague Eduardo Garcia sitting there in the back of the room. I had the, the pleasure of meeting with Talan's uh, boss, the finance, former finance minister of Sri Lanka, a month ago uh, when we were in Sri Lanka, and Eduardo did a fantastic job of structuring our visit there, and we, we got to see a great deal in a period of three days. But we rely a great deal upon the, um, the foreign policy infrastructure of the, of the US government, our colleagues in the economic um, portions of the embassy, the economic officers, the foreign commercial service, and so forth. But what is really important to the private capital that, that OPIC lends within this, this project is understanding the, the playing field uh, on which these projects are based. And the fundamental rule of politics is, is politicians love to confer lots of short-term benefits that have long-term costs. And they won't be along, around when the long-term costs come due. Um, that's the, the fundamental challenge of political economy. I don't think I'm being rude or impolitic by pointing it out. That's just reality. And so the dance that investors do in this PPP structure is to try to mitigate the risks of political change as well as mitigate the risks of the operational risks of the assets in which they're investing so that they can feel comfortable putting in capital for a, a long period of time. And, and in fact, usually the equity exits early 
So the biggest risk is to entities like OPIC and our sister um, development and, and international finance institutions because we're in the deal with our debt, which has no upside. You know, best case, we just get paid back with some interest. We're in that deal for 10, 15, 20 years. The equity may sell out in three or four years um, to long-term capital from a pension fund um, or, or some sort of investment fund. And so I think what's interesting in this discussion is talking about the intersection between the providers of capital and the risks that they're taking and the political infrastructure that exists and the way policymakers not only set the playing field within a country, but also in, in the context of this conference, how countries around the region cooperate together because there are many economic opportunities at the boundaries of these political entities. And the whole idea of regional cooperation is obviously to make countries more interdependent and the people more prosperous. Uh, and the only way that happens is, is in political dialogue, but also dialogue with the ultimate providers of the capital, because there are only two sources uh, of capital for these projects. Tax money that is raised locally and, and private capital that comes in from within the nation or, or internationally. And so the ground rules under which that capital is deployed and the, the, the laws, tax arrangements and so forth that, that affect it, that's what's crucial to even making these PPP projects tenable. Thank you, Bill. Now that we've got 30 extra billion dollars sitting with you, we're going to be hearing as to which other countries and which other sectors you're going to be putting that on in. And what are you going to be looking at those? But uh, before we get on to that, Kejang, we'd love to hear your views. Thank you. Please. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator and uh, colleagues on the dais. Uh, uh, I think uh, it's, it's a great opportunity for me to be here uh, in this uh, August gathering. I'd like to start with a quote uh, from my king. Uh, no nation today can stand alone in achievement. Time is slowly telling us that there can be no lasting individual success without success as a community, and there cannot be lasting national progress and success if it does not fit into the future of global peace, harmony, and equality. The world must progress together or fail together. And in the context of this, uh, unquote, in the context of this uh, uh, conference, uh, the idea and, and the focus and the objective is, uh, I think, to progress and uh, walk the talk. I'd like to start with uh, a reflection on uh, where we are, uh, where Bhutan is uh, right now. We have just crossed uh, what we call the five-year plan, the 11th five-year plan, uh, middle of this year, uh, and uh, we are now embarking on, on, on the 12th five-year plan. Uh, the earlier uh, five-year plan uh, is important in the context of uh, uh, the country in the sense of uh, having uh, put in a lot of effort in, in terms of uh, building relationships, in, in terms of not just looking at connectivity beyond borders, but connecting our own rural, far-flung, rugged terrain areas of the country. Uh, and uh, besides, uh, in the context of uh, this uh, conference, we have also put in place a public-private uh, partnership policy, uh, which is an important instrument to mobilize uh, funding for projects uh, that are uh, going to be implemented in, in, the, in the next uh, five years. And we have... Uh, uh, recently elected a new government, uh, third, uh, the third uh, uh, set of parliamentarians uh, who have uh, just come in. Uh, the cabinet is going to be formed next week and uh, we are all excited. Uh, their uh, uh, main uh, objective is to narrow the gap and uh, I again see this uh, uh, conference in the, in the context of uh, connectivity, connecting people, connecting uh, cultures and uh, uh, not just about uh, physical uh, connectivity, as, as some of the uh, panelists yesterday was uh, mentioning. Uh, the plan objective uh, that uh, we have looking forward uh, for the next five years, 2018 to 2023 in Bhutan, has been anchored uh, on the uh, timeless vision and wisdom of our kings, uh, as well as on the constitution of Bhutan. We are a young democracy. Uh, 
we, we have, uh, as I mentioned, selected, uh, the, elected the third set of uh, parliamentarians. Uh, and uh, talk about uncertainties of markets. We, we have, in, in the three elections that we have, we have three different parties uh, coming into power. So uh, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, uncertainty and, and, and hopefully uh, the changes that we look forward to uh, in, in the context of uh, taking the country forward. Uh, additionally, uh, a lot of our uh, plans uh, and, and the objectives are, are based on the international and regional goals and uh, commitments like the Sustainability Development Goals. Uh, Bhutan uh, was fortunate to provide our own inputs from the gross national happiness uh, development philosophy that we follow into the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we, we had a very active uh, participation in, in uh, uh, moving uh, the Sustainable Development Goals 2030. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, our uh, planning process uh, goes uh, to the, to, the, to the lowest level, the, the common man. That's, that's what uh, is, is critical to a small country and uh, um, uh, equally so for many, uh, all, all countries. Uh, uh, we tend to forget, uh, forget uh, the, the lowest uh, uh, common denominator at times and uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, live, live behind uh, uh, our, our uh, people. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a critical uh, element uh, to look at the grassroots and then uh, uh, look at how uh, these are, uh, they are bro brought into the mainstream and, and uh, uh, then uh, relate this into the context of uh, the regional, the sub-regional and, and, and the global uh, development uh, context. In Bhutan, we have, uh, I'd like to share uh, three examples of uh, public-private partnerships that we have uh, done uh, in the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. Uh, one uh, is, is, is a power uh, plant that was uh, implemented uh, uh, with, uh, uh, again, uh, with, with a lot of advisory from uh, international organizations like uh, the Asian Development Bank, International Finance Corporation, and uh, uh, the World Bank, uh, among, among others. Uh, so uh, we had uh, a power plant uh, with uh, uh, an SPB, uh, we implemented with an SPB, uh, formed uh, uh, between uh, an uh, Indian uh, private company uh, and uh, a public uh, corporation uh, in, in Bhutan, and, and it's, it's already started uh, generating, uh, um, generating power uh, in, in 2015, and it's, it's a successful uh, model, uh, I, I, I would uh, say. Uh, in the ICT sector, we built uh, uh, the first IT park uh, called uh, Thimputek Park with uh, uh, with, uh, with the advisory from the World Bank, uh, and uh, uh, we had uh, a Singaporean uh, company participate uh, in, in the tender. So I'm, I'm calling this international public-private partnerships. Uh, and uh, uh, and it's, it's also a successful uh, project. Uh, it now uh, employs, uh, uh, it was completed in 2012, uh, so in the last uh, four, uh, five years, uh, we, uh, the, the park is employing some uh, close to some uh, 1,000 Bhutanis, and 1,000 uh, is, is a big number in the context of Bhutan. So uh, uh, another success story, of course, uh, uh, the, the project, uh, the, the program has been restructured uh, to, to tune with the times. And uh, the third one is, is in the municipality area. We had uh, a solid uh, integrated uh, solid waste management project implemented with assistance of the ADB, uh, we have a current uh, project going on for a multi-layer, uh, multi-level off-street car park facility for the capital city, uh, building two, two infrastructure with uh, uh, and the SPV, uh, the, the special purpose vehicle that we have is a private company from Nepal with uh, two uh, private uh, companies uh, from Bhutan implementing the project. So these are some of the some of the success stories Bhutan has had in in, in the in the PPP uh, arena. And uh, in terms of risks, uh, uh, as, as uh, my uh, colleagues have already alluded to, uh, these are distributed uh, largely between the public and the private partners according to the ability of each to assess, control, and cope with them. And wherever necessary as a, as a developing country, we have uh, uh, been uh, fortunate to, to be helped, uh, advised by the, world, the likes of World Bank and other, other international organizations. In the context of this uh, uh, conference, uh, thanks to the organizers, uh, there is no doubt that uh, regional economic cooperation and integration can uh, fruitfully complement the national actions for achieving 
sustainable uh, development goals in South Asia, for instance, harnessing the potential of regional value chains, uh, which can help in the creation of productive uh, capacities for South Asian countries, uh, besides generating additional intra-regional exports. Regional cooperation can also strengthen energy security besides saving billions of dollars in electricity costs. Cooperation to develop regional hydro potential as pioneered by Bhutan could now extend to, can be replicated in Nepal, uh, Afghanistan, uh, which is already taking place to a large extent. And uh, South Asian countries could also uh, strengthen the collective food security through strengthening uh, the various uh, food bank initiatives that the SARC has uh, undertaken. Harmonization of standards uh, for, for different uh, products, uh, including food products, pooling resources uh, for research and development and enhancing uh, productivity in different se sectors. On the financing uh, of uh, public-private partnerships, uh, implementing the sustainability development goals in South Asia will require a huge amount of resources, including uh, social investments in the order of uh, 10 to 20 percent of uh, GDP besides uh, around 5 trillion for closing infrastructure gaps by 20 th uh, 2030, besides investments in enhancing environmental sustainability. This is based on information from UNSCAP. Uh, PPPs are uh, a proven mechanism to supplement public investments in sustainable infrastructure projects. Countries like uh, India are already uh, implementing, uh, uh, harnessing the potential of uh, corporate social responsibility to supplement public resources. And I thought we could learn uh, from this uh, to replicate CSR programs at the grassroots level in different countries. Uh, there are also proven models of universal service uh, obligations. Uh, for instance, in the telecom sector, we had implemented a uh, universal service fund mechanism where uh, the private player and the incumbent player contributed to the universal service fund. And uh, I know this is not strictly PPP, but there is also a private component, and the public uh, enables this uh, to get into the rural areas. So again, looking at the grassroots in terms of how private money can flow into the, into the, into the uh, grassroots. Uh, in, the, in the context of uh, connectivity, as I mentioned earlier, I think uh, what is important is, is to ensure uh, within our own countries uh, connectivity uh, to the last man and women. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, can, can be done through, through a lot of social uh, initiatives, impact uh, investments, uh, and uh, the, the one I mentioned about universal service uh, funds that could be uh, utilized, which, which indirectly flows uh, from, from different parties, including the private sector. And uh, at uh, the regional and international levels, I thought uh, there, there's a lot to look at in terms of uh, uh, capacity building where uh, private uh, uh, companies, say for instance in Bhutan and uh, a private company in, in, uh, in the U.S. can come together to build capacity to, to cater to efficiently implementing uh, PPPs, uh, uh, PPPs uh, which, which, are, which are fairly complex uh, for, for developing and, and least developed countries like Bhutan. Uh, in, t uh, in terms of uh, alignment, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the development goals, uh, uh, Bhutan uh, has had a comfortable uh, situation in, in terms of uh, our uh, f uh, development philosophy of gross national uh, happiness, closely aligning with the sustainability uh, development goals, uh, and uh, also other uh, aspects of uh, being uh, uh, ahead or, or in tandem with, with, with where the global uh, uh, scenario is, is, is moving. Uh, we, uh, we are lucky to be, to be able to tap funds uh, uh, as, an, as an LDC into, into global funds like the Global Environment Facility, Green Climate Fund, uh, LDC Fund, uh, and, and similar other funds which are, which are more accessible to developing countries and LDCs uh, like uh, Bhutan. So these are some of the things that uh, uh, I wanted to share and, and if there are uh, questions I can uh, take it later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kejang. We actually have a yes. We have a list of questions staring at us on the screen, and uh, let me go through that. And let me go through that quickly. But you can take your time for your answers because the answers is what is very critical, and you guys have done a great job on that. Thilan, the first one sits right there for you. Various foreign governments are interested in funding infrastructure in Sri Lanka. Gosh, you guys are doing a great job on that one. <laughs> what is Sri Lanka's domestic plan on directing such in funding? Well, there is a silver lining and a dark cloud to that question because it was too much money chasing projects that gave too little return. That's 
resulted in some of our debt to GDP ratios going beyond uh, limits that I would like to see. But nevertheless, what's important to understand is that when it comes to a PPP project, we do not directly deal with financiers. That is the job of the PPP investor. Now, if the project, if there's a particular project where the government provides a direct sovereign guarantee to a lender, I don't touch it. The PPP agency doesn't touch it. It is not a PPP in the, in the definition that we've adopted in our procurement guidelines. So that becomes a G2G, government to government, guarant sovereign guaranteed project. Now when it comes, as I mentioned earlier, the way in which we provide the security to the lender for a PPP project that is sourced by the private party would be A, via a direct lender's agreement, which the, which the governments have done in the past, where the government enters into a direct lender's agreement not to guarantee the loan, but to permit the lender to give, provide the lender with certain stepping rights in the event of the failure of the PPP investor. The second instrument we use is what is called an implementation agreement, where we assure the performance of the line ministry or the line agency concern that enters into a PPP agreement. So to summarize my answer to the question, uh, we do not directly deal with lenders when it comes to PPP projects. Our job is to create a nice pipeline of projects so that lenders can get together with the bidders and, and give the best possible deal for the government of Sri Lanka. Kilan, do you want to share some points on how you de-risk a project while you're creating a concession? How we de-risk? How you de-risk it before it is, let's say, bid out to the private sector uh, on a PPP uh, basis? I mean, obviously, it is to A, follow a rigorous... Uh, procedure in terms of procurement. Now, in 1998, Sri Lanka introduced its first PPP procurement guidelines, which was called the BOOT guidelines at that time. And I'm happy to see the chairman of the National Procurement Commission here. So with the formation of the NPC, uh, we worked to updating these guidelines to 2018. And once the NPC ratifies these guidelines, they become embedded in the legislative framework because the NPC is a constitutional body. So, so, so one way of, of, of providing comfort to the bidders is, is, is that. Secondly, we have a very good legal framework and we don't, do not have a single instance where a PPP project has failed or the government has reneged unilaterally or in, in, in any way on, from a PPP agreement. We've had one instance where a PPP project agreement had to be renegotiated uh, with the Chinese company, China Harbor, when it came to the Colombo port city, the huge land reclamation project that's happening, but it was renegotiated and recommenced, and now it's, 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 it's reaching completion. Uh, the other aspects that we, 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 we provide are obviously, you know, drafting of the legal agreements and the sanctity that, that the Attorney General's Department provides these uh, legal agreements. So, so I think a combination of country's track record and professionalism in which, with which a PPP project is competed is one way that we ensure that, 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 that it becomes a sustainable public-private partnership throughout the term of the concession. Thanks. Bill, there's a question for you. You can read it, right? Competition laws for PPP projects in India and US are quite different. What do you think is a major cross-learning for both? By the way, I'm told your Delaware Bridge, uh, the new concession agreement has, has a lot to do with the concession agreements we've created in India recently. Yeah. So. Uh, Actually, I have more understanding of PPP agreements outside of the United States than I, I do inside of them. One interesting facet, of course, that a lot of people don't understand unless they know India and the US well is that India and the US have in common a federal structure. And so, for example, when we go in to look at whether to lend to a project in India, we're looking first and foremost at the state in which the project is located and the governing laws in that state because states have a great deal of power here as they do in the United States. So if you're looking at a project in the United States, the first thing you ask is where is it and what, what are the federal and state laws governing it? And usually, and this is the same in Canada as well, it is a state or provincial government that has set the terms of the agreements. Um, and also you have generally a long running track record of a particular political party that may be prevailing at a state level um, and the nature of the legislature. So you can have a good idea of, st as, as I said, the fundamental thing that investors are interested in is stability of tax and law. They don't want regulatory changes and they want to lock in their investment return. 
and don't want to have to worry about uh, tax rates shifting around, for example, or tariff rates shifting around. Um, but to, to pull back for a minute, I think the, the more important question is what are the fundamental features generally, no matter where politically the, the project is, is located. And I always just come back to slim, sim, simplicity is best. Um, when people are asking me what sort of innovative financing structures are necessary to get these projects financed, my, my general answer to that is none. Um, simple debt financing in these transactions works. Simple equity financing works. You don't need financial engineering. Um, you do need currency hedging, uh, which if you have to lend in local currency, and that's difficult to do, then that becomes a bit of a challenge for you. But, but really a simple, predictable structure that's amenable to, to very transparent analysis is what is, is best. Um, the more complexity you have in anything. When, when I deal with equity investors and they put a very, very complex legal organizational structure in front of me as a lender, I get suspicious. Uh, and it's the same thing when I'm dealing with governments. The more complexity, the more I shy, shy away as a lender from, from participating in a project. It's interesting, and there's a very interesting question. Amber, let me just take it for you. What measures and mechanisms are required to manage risks unique to South Asia? I think we can spend the next three hours discussing this and uh, with lots of case studies and actual bloodletting that we've seen in India. Well, uh, I'll, I'll keep it very simple. Uh, I'll be a little repetitive also. We mentioned it earlier when I was speaking. It comes down to three, uh, three simple letters, A, S, and P, affordability, sustainability, and predictability. The, uh, and, and then whenever we, we have these debates and discussions and uh, huge disagreements uh, in, the, in the room, when we have lenders, developers, uh, representatives of the people, and then, uh, of course, politicians and bureaucrats, I think this is where it all comes down to if we just go keep it affordable because uh, we can have very high user charges because that's good for the maybe the developer or the lender in the short term but sooner or later as I gave examples comes to bite sustainability uh, in the sense uh, if it's on the other hand if the regulators get too aggressive or the governments get too aggressive and beat down the user prices for short term uh, uh, political uh, uh, popularity or something uh, as, as uh, Will also mention these are 30, 40, or 50 year contracts, and politicians are there only for five years. So, the sustainability uh, uh, is very important. And the last but not the least is predictability. Every lender squirms at uh, change of uh, approach, a change of uh, or, or shifting of the goalposts, even on the KPIs, because every program will have key performance indicators, uh, like you have in airports, ports, or, or say highways. And uh, if a new government comes in and uh, they start bringing in off-book KPIs, and that happens a lot, especially in, in our region, South Asia, that pred predictability is very important. I've seen that in the case of airports and, and ports also. So I, I'll just stop here because it's a, it's a very long discussion, but uh, affordability, sustainability, and predictability. If we can just ensure these three things through those 200-page contract agreements, concession agreements, I think uh, we are home. Thanks, Deepak. Thanks. Thank you, got two questions for you right there. So. I won't go through the questions because I guess yeah, you can, I can see can, them between here. I, right? can, I yes. can see those, yeah, uh, two interesting questions. Uh, I was expecting the first question, but uh, I haven't prepared. Uh, uh, I'm not prepared to answer that. Uh, I, can, I can see an opportunity in, in terms of uh, a tollway, a PPP, uh, in, in such a, uh, in such a uh, situation in, in, under those agreements. I'm not very familiar, uh, frankly, uh, with, with, with the agreement, but... Uh, PPPs. I mean, you can you can have in any uh, any situation. <laughs> Largely, it has just has to be feasible, and uh, the risks are are, are properly uh, you know just distributed and, and shared among the stakeholders. That was the first one. The second one: uh, How does Bhutan use the Gross National Happiness Index to measure its uh, PPP uh, in infrastructure uh, projects? Thank you. And uh, uh, the Gross National Happiness uh, uh, Development Philosophy has uh, four pillars. Uh, these are uh, equitable uh, socioeconomic development, uh, conservation of environment, uh, preservation of uh, culture, 
and tradition and uh, of course uh, good governance. Uh, so the four pillars and then uh, we have uh, the nine domains uh, which, which uh, support the four pillars and these are again you know, subdivided into 133 uh, indicators. Uh, in, in terms of uh, projects uh, and even uh, and the, the, uh, the higher level policies, each of, each of these programs and policies need to go uh, through a process called GNH uh, tool uh, screening. And uh, if, if, uh, if, you, if, if a particular project, uh, be it a PPP or, or, or a normal uh, government project, a politically motivated project, if it doesn't pass that screening tool, uh, uh, then, then it is rejected. It's as simple as that. And uh, as I mentioned, the elements, uh, the, the indicators, the factors that are taken into account are, are around sustainability, uh, around uh, just not just uh, material, uh, you know, gains that uh, the country uh, country will have. Uh, so uh, uh, we, we we give a lot of uh, important in terms of the screening. And uh, a clear example is when we screened for our membership to the WTO, uh, we we didn't go through the screening tool. We we failed the screening tool, so we are not yet a member of the WTO. That's an example that uh, I can uh, I can cite here and. Uh, PPPs are like other projects screened uh, for, for, for feasibility for GNH, cross-national happenings. Thank you. It's a very interesting question, and I'm going to open it to all four of you very quickly. Is it a good idea to have uniform standards for green financing, especially in PPPs in South Asia? Number starting to be. Very Quick simply. Short answers, yes. Why ES? Yes, uh, but, but to a large extent, I think you have to also look at the capacity of, of uh, each of the uh, each of the countries, and uh, th there's an opportunity to collaborate. Uh, I mean, there there is no hindrance. Uh, to I think I think it's 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 uh, it's a largely yes. Yeah, I think globally yes, in the sense that all of the projects that we finance have to adhere to environmental and social policy standards. We fo follow the IFC performance standards to a large extent. But I'd also pull back from that and say no, in the sense that what is important is what's relevant for a particular country or a particular state. And I think that is the most important consideration of um, what, because these projects affect local populations, the issues that are most relevant, environmental issues, for example, that are most relevant to local populations, that's really what's most important. And so there's an interplay between federal regulation in countries and local reg regulations. In a lot of countries, federal re regulation is very, very powerful and local re regulation doesn't really exist. Um, but to the extent it does, it's very important to consider that. Oh yes, the answer is yes. Again, uh, I'm. I emphasize the importance of project preparation and particularly in Sri Lanka, some of the environmental and social issues are addressed right up front. And I must also add that the reason for the suspension of the Colombo Port City project was the inadequacy of the environmental safeguards and a brand new environmental impact assessment process went through and we have a very comprehensive public consultation process. So that also helps in attracting finances such as yourselves and, and and those who you know, extend long-term financing, because uh, one of the reasons why we became quite rigorous in this process is that Sri Lanka's capital markets being very thin, we had to make sure that our project preparation was that much more robust in order to attract long-term funding. So that takes me to the other one, which is the multi-currency swap mechanisms you know, to fund PPPs. What are your views on that? I think they're very important uh, in, in, in structuring uh, PPP projects, and I think that's your area of specialty as well, isn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, again, to the extent that I get back to my original comment that I'm a great advocate of economic simplicity. Um, to the extent that you need mechanisms such as currency swaps in order to make projects ban bankable and financeable, these usually come up, uh, about because of mismatches between the currency of revenue in an offtake contract and the currency of financing, and you always have to match those two. That's really where you would need something like that. Deepak, if I can, may I get back to the former question? Because one, one other thing I'd like to, to add about uniform environmental and, and social standards is that I think it is very important for organizations like OPEC, the IFC, and development banks to push for uniform environmental and social standards to a certain degree. I'm, I'm financing a project right now in North Africa 
and I was just there last week, and we've been working on it. It's a very, very big petrochemical project. We've been working on it for about four years. And the, I was talking to the um, opposing counsel for the sponsor, whom I've got to know quite well on that deal, and OPEC is lending with uh, three or four other export credit agencies. And he and his sponsor are used to working with export credit agencies, which are primarily, of course, concerned with the physical content in these projects. They aren't as used to working with development finance institutions, which are focused on the developmental aspects, and along with that, the, the social environmental um, framework are around these projects. And he is forever picking on OPIC as the only development finance institution in this lending consortium, as, as, as he jokingly put it, puts it as an Englishman, imposing Western labor standards on a developing market. Um, and these have to do with worker rights. They have to do with child labor. And he's, he's in a sense, pulling my leg. To, but, but in a sense, he's not. He's very, very annoyed that his sponsor, who's developing this complex project, has to address these labor and worker rights standards, the environmental standards that are much more stringent than his export credit agency lenders require. And I think it's important, we've had to, on a regular basis, fight this battle with him. And he has learned, partially because he's raising a lot of equity, the sponsor's raising a lot of equity from development finance institutions. It's been a process of education for him that, oh, I've been working with export credit agencies for the past 10, 15 years. Now I'm having to raise capital from development finance or institutions, and they really care about these things. And so, the world is changing, I have to pay attention to them. And I think we're a very, we're a very effective and strong advocate of that, and I think it's, it's very important. Well, now that I have you on the mic, a very quick one. Next 24 months, your top three countries, your top three sectors. That 30 billion is what I'm referring yeah. to. Yeah. So, yeah, it, I, it's an interesting time for SDPAC because I don't, frankly, I don't know what we will look like a year or a year and a half fr from now when we are this new, U.S. Um, International Development Finance Corporation. Um, I can tell you in the next 30 months what will not change, and that is a very, very strong focus on the Indo-Pacific region. And in South Asia, in particular, obviously India is the biggest country as an anchor of that. Um, my executive vice president, who is the number two in our agency, appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by the Senate. He and I were in India and Sri Lanka earlier in October. We would like to do a lot more business in this region. Uh, gr the purpose of our trip going to Sri Lanka is to figure out how OPEC can finance more projects there and what is necessary in terms of um, reforms in the structure around PPPs, around the production of intellectual property and so forth that create more bankable projects there. Uh, I was in Nepal a couple years ago at a power investment conference. We would love to be able to do projects there and in Bhutan. Um, and what those countries, which obviously are very, very different, have in common is very young democracies. And it will take some time before the parliamentary system and the civil service system there, I think, really understand what's necessary to attract foreign capital. So in answer to your question, Deepak, I, we don't focus on specific countries, but I can tell you that this region in particular will remain extremely important to, to OPEC and to our successor development finance organization. Thanks, Bill. We have a poll here on, all of you have voted. Is it a good idea to have uniform standards for green financing in PPPs in South Asia? I'll give you the results just after we've had this question from Jan. Jan, you got it here? Not sure, 25%. Very interesting. Jan, very quick. Three action points on regional cooperation. Action steps we can take right away to get this region coordinated and joining the dots much faster. Um, I think uh, the first one would be in terms of uh, air connectivity, uh, increasing uh, both domestic and international mm -hmm. connectivity to each of the countries. Uh, and and uh, I think uh, we had, we had a, a case, strong case there in, in terms of uh, what's happening in India. Uh, of course, uh, the land uh, transport system is, is another area 
uh, which is uh, which is which is an important uh, uh, infrastructure area to look into. The third one uh, uh, I would uh, think is hydropower uh, in in the context of uh, uh, a lot of the countries uh, embarking on hydropower, and Bhutan uh, has has done a lot of uh, a lot of experiments and and uh, successfully so. Uh, but uh, there is a lot of uh, room for improvement. So, uh, yeah, these three things. Thanks. But I think Amber, very quickly, three points from you. Action points, okay. I would say three T, trade, tourism, and talking. That's it. You give me 30,000 feet answers. I wanted more specific, specific action I'll, steps. I think, first of all, we need to talk more, uh, the third T. And uh, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, Mm -hmm. If I just come straight to tourism and aviation, which is uh, so close to my heart, uh, uh, within the South Asian region, there's so much of uh, national di di diversity, religious diversity, cultural diversity. We should be doing uh, 30 to 50 million uh, tourist arrivals. Uh, uh, just one Thailand and Malaysia do 30 or 35 million each. China is out there at 50, 56 million uh, foreign tourist arrivals. We struggle at about uh, 10 or 11, I mean, of which a majority is actually Bangladesh. As a very small number uh, coming from the West. So tourism, huge opportunity, both from a jobs perspective and a GDP perspective. This is specific. Uh, trade also is linked to that. Uh, uh, we have to keep politics out of it. And I'm sorry for being repetitive. I think the more we talk and the more we have conferences and events like these, we break barriers. In. Talking about talking, open to the audience very quickly. Arms up, please. We have one right there. Yes. Would you please introduce yourself? Very quickly, short questions. And who is your question addressed to? Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Sanjay Mangal and I work as a fellow for Cuts International. Uh, I have two quick questions. Number one, today we are seeing that uh, regional groupings are going to be sectoral focused. For example, we take BIMSTEC. So how do you see the regional cooperation or regional agreements in terms of promoting public-private partnership to promote de-risk and sustainable investment? That is one. Number two, <coughs> Many of the PPP projects, I can give you a very good example of KMP Expressway, which is going to be open for public in another few days, but after the eight years of deadline, eight years late to deadline. So in that period, public suffers because during the construction of that project, public suffers a lot. The traffic route has to be diverted and so on. So from the customers or consumers point of view, who's going to be responsible and what should you, like how the company or even the government who are partnering in that project should be responsible Thanks. for that discomfort to consumers. Thank you. Thank you. Tilam, do you want to take that one? Um, in terms of looking at de-risking, I, I, I still reiterate what I said earlier that I think the PPP agencies or the relevant agencies within our South Asian region need to collaborate, uh, particularly because I believe there's a lot of knowledge sharing. For example, uh, uh, Mr. Kizang, the Sri Lanka embarked on hydro energy through PPPs in the, in, in the late 1990s, and today we have 350 megawatts of small to medium scale private power that is being, being, being generated. On the issue of uh, uh, delays, again, it, it is a combination of uh, bureaucracy, and, and you know, it's, it's a rather difficult question to answer. I think if, if we can have a robust set of guidelines, by which, 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 are, which, are in, which, which somebody can be taken to courts on as well. I think that, you know, courts do cause delays, but I believe a robust set of guidelines uh, that, that PPP partners as well as the public government agencies need to follow is, is, is very important in, uh, in avoiding delays. Thanks. There was a question at the back there. How much time do we have? Do we have some time? Yes, lovely. Please. Right. Uh, myself, Uday Mehta from Katz International. Uh, my first question is to Amber. Uh, I think you spoke about one very important aspect of predictability. And I think my question is that a uh, lot of policy and regulatory uncertainties which affect uh, investment decision making, uh, and I'm sure from India's experience, you would have a lot of stories to share with us. And my second question is to Thilan. Uh, I think you raised a very important point when it comes to public-private partnership. Uh, people should be the center of it. So do you think it would be the right time for us to move from a PPP to a people-public-private partnership? Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, well, thanks, uh, thanks for the question. I'll keep it very short. Uh, uh, 
In terms of predictability, uh, that's why the current thinking of the government is to shift towards a predetermined tariff model because uh, the previous approach was on a cost plus basis, so that did create some uh, doubts about the fact that uh, there's been some bit, a bit of an overbuild and ultimately all that capex is passed on to the passengers, which then uh, creates a backlash. And that creates a, a risk for the lenders and the developers also when the next uh, tariff period starts and, and the tariff determination happens. So that's why uh, we are uh, evaluating the, the highways and the ports model where you freeze a particular tariff and leave it uh, and just link it to inflation and step back and let the industry take a call and decide their concession fee that they'll pay to the government so that there's this every five year kind of a argument and then uh, disputes and going to the courts can be avoided. Today, most of the tariffs are now also being decided at the tribunal level or even in the courts by people who have no knowledge of aviation with all due respects to them. That is uh, what uh, we're trying to end. That will uh, lead to a little more predictability. There are other aspects, but maybe we can discuss offline over a cup of tea. Yes, uh, answer your question in one sentence. Behind every successful PPP, there's a PPP in people. Uh, one reason why we in Sri Lanka succeeded is that when we were brought in, we were ex-investment bankers, working with public servants, and I find this consistent in most of developing Asia, the skill set required to structure complex PPPs do not exist in traditional public sector uh, departments and ministries. And therefore, it is vitally important that we, there is a central PPP agency that brings in the right type of skills, and this is the very reason I'm looking at new legislation to be brought in, not for any legal part to be vested within the PPP agency, but to be able to bring in people from the private sector, paying their market rates, putting them on contracts so that if you don't perform, you leave, but bring people in from the private sector, working in close collaboration with the public sector, and that to me is a sine qua non for successful uh, PPPs to be implemented. Yeah, I mean, I'll just I'll reiterate what I think is a very, very important point that Tilan just made, which is that the skill sets to implement these projects from a financial and economic point of view uniformly don't exist in government. And it's, it's not just in South Asia, it's in the United States. It just doesn't exist anywhere. I mean, I work in the federal government and I would be stunned. In, in OPIC, we have probably about 80, 75 or 80 people uh, who structure these projects. We have a team of lawyers who work with them, all who have come from the private sector law firms who have done project financings. I'd be stunned if outside of OPIC and the Export-Import Bank, there are more than, you know, 100 people in the entire U.S. government who can even grasp what we do. And so it is very, very important that people with this experience, and it comes from banking, it comes from capital intensive corporations like the one I worked for for most of my career. And legal as well. And, and legal, so, and thank you for emphasizing that. The most important point is, I mean, I like to think as, as a commercial lead on my project that I'm the most important person on the deal. I most certainly am not. Um, the most important person on my deal is my attorney and particularly my, my external international counsel because these projects are structured around a network of contracts. You have a special purpose vehicle, you have a network of contracts, dozens of contracts, that enforce behavior that helps these assets operate in a way that benefits the providers of capital and the consumers of the service over a very long period of time. That's a very, very sophisticated mechanism that took hundreds and hundreds of years to develop. And the lawyers are extremely important because without water tank contracts and without an environment in which you have um, predictable uh, enforcement of contract and law, these projects don't get done, they don't operate. Um, there are just case after case after case of governments implementing PPP projects or just having concessions that they invite private capital in on. They have, for example, in a power project, um, terms for 10, 15 years, and then three, four years into the project, they decide to change the terms unilaterally, and that kills their ability to raise capital in that manner, manner for a generation. Investors are just not going to come back to that market. Thank you. Last two questions. There was one arm right there, which I'd seen earlier. Yes, please. And after that, you back. Presentations have been uh, focusing on physical infrastructure. South Asia needs ports, roads, airports. But more critical and uh, at this juncture for South Asia is PPP in social sector, uh, education, health. 
Well, I, it's not a question, it's an issue that I, as a social scientist, would like to raise that the organizers should have taken the South Asian uh, social sector partnerships as a key area for discussion. Probably, they should be the agenda for the future discussions. Thank you. Uh, in Does fact, I really want a quick comment quickly, on that. Uh, PPPs in social infrastructure have been done in digital infrastructure, affordable housing, and in education, particularly in universities, and it is quite possible to proceed on that basis. Especially education, healthcare. Yes. Right? yes. And healthcare. Those are big sectors, exactly. as you've seen, even in the Indian context. Sorry. Yeah, can I contribute something quickly? So I agree with you completely. Um, I was here in Delhi at the beginning of October. There was a global impact investing conference. And that is a, a sector that is very interesting right now because it is an intersection of philanthropic deployment of capital, investment deployment of capital, and uh, market failures in the public sector that are being addressed through means of private capital. And it's a very, it's a, it's a very new and exciting development. And, but I think that is the mechanism by which these, uh, these social effects using private capital are best addressed. Last question of the panel, uh, that's for you. Uh, good morning, thank you for this opportunity. I'm Tamcha Dem from Bhutan Association of Women Entrepreneurs. Uh, actually this is more of a, I don't know whether it's a question or an observation, because everyone is talking about being inclusive and you know, so many good words are being said that encourages me to speak up today especially about making economics simple. And uh, I would like to draw your attention to the grassroots and the reason why the grassroots you know, need to be discussed at every forum is because the only thing lacking is networking. The only thing la lacking is networking. When we can aggregate you know, and get our products in volumes, will there be buyers? Especially, I mean, I'm addressing this to Mr. William since you know, you're the one with a lot of money, I understand, with the billions, and I'm just wondering if a little bit of that could be directed towards women who cannot get into you know, the mainstream uh, economics is only because we lack in volumes and we lack in networking. Thank you. Yeah. And that's an excellent question. OPEC is very dedicated financing women entrepreneurs, and, and we have been through, particularly through SME financing that we've done. Um, under our current management, we have what we call the 2X initiative, which is focused specifically on measuring development in our projects as it benefits women. And this is everything from local um, women-owned businesses, SMEs, larger projects which have significant participation of women in a management capacity. And particularly, I've spent my career in the energy industry and people don't generally think about um, providing energy, whether it's fuel through oil and gas or electricity, as having a great effect on women. But it has an incredible effect, particularly in places where women bear um, the work for drawing water, for collecting fuel in, in the form of firewood and other things, getting them denser, uh, more powerful sources of fuel and electricity dramatically increases the quality of their lives and their families' lives, their health and their longevity. And that is something through our 2X initiative currently that we're keenly um, aware of and focused on financing. And I would encourage you to go to our website at opic.gov and, and check out what we're doing on that front. Thank you very much for that. It's been a very interesting morning, at least for me it was, and I'm sure you'll have seen a lot of value in this one. We actually saw the complexities which are involved in creating these concession agreements. You saw what is going behind in a practitioner's mind, on a policymaker's mind. You also saw that I think what's coming out recurrently is that connectivity and conversations are two very critical aspects of creating this entire uh, closer knit, if I may say so, for the region. And it's a no-brainer that we need to do it, and that is what is going to benefit everyone. So with that, may I please thank the panelists, guys. A great uh, set of thoughts for all of you. And thank you all for being such an excellent audience. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bagla, and all the speakers for a very interesting and engaging session.
I think one interesting takeaway, which as organizers, I think it might be a good idea to debate and construct uh, some sort of a people's public-private partnership knowledge platform, I think which would benefit a great deal in terms of sharing of best practices, and I think most important sharing of uh, practices which have not been successful so that we don't repeat, and you know, it's because it's again a very costly affair. Uh, with that, thank you very much, and we close the plenary four, and I request my colleagues to hand over the token of appreciation. So for some of us who have joined this morning uh, for the session today, these are certificates which we are giving to all the speakers of trees which have been planted in East Sikkim by a company. And the trees have been dedicated to the names of each and every individual who has been given the certificate. Thank you. So I just have two important house announcements to make and I would request the attention of everybody. So one is uh, guests who are leaving today. Uh, so the guests who are leaving today from the session uh, would request if you could all please check out by the lunchtime. And uh, with this we break for tea, but we come back with all the parallel sessions starting from post the tea session. What's really important to be noted is if you look at the badges, there are stickers which have been put on each and everybody's badge. These are color coded and the agenda itself, there are colors which are being given specifically to the specific sessions. So for example, the parallel session track 1A, which is going to take place in Shahaja ballroom, which is the one where we are sitting right now, it would have a red dot square on, on, your, on, your, uh, you know, on your name badges. So people who have been given those uh, stickers would need to come back in this room. Uh, parallel track 1B, which is going to focus on maritime and inland waterway connectivity, that's going to be uh, a blue mark on your badge. And last but not the least, parallel track 1C, which is in Jahangir room, which would be purple color. So the Jahangir room is on the first floor, and the Mumtaz room is just next door, but we'll also have our team to help you in terms of reaching to the specific rooms. With that, we shall break for tea and we shall request all of you to be back in the rooms by 11 o'clock. Thank you very much.